This video is brought to you by Element. Okay, so this one's going to be a little different. I know that baseball history is kind of supposed to be my thing. I mean, it is like 50% of my name. But there's something happening in Major League Baseball that I think needs to be acknowledged, and some players that I think we need to talk about. Let's start with the man in the title. It was Game 7 of the 2018 NLCS. Facing a 2-1 deficit, MVP Christian Yelich sent an offering from Dodgers pitcher Julio Urias into the left center field gap. It was a ball that should have fallen for a two-out RBI double, scoring Lorenzo Cain from second. I say should have, because Chris Taylor apparently had other plans. For Taylor, and he makes a spectacular over-the-shoulder catch on the warning track, falling to the ground. What a play by Chris Taylor, saving a run and ending the inning. Here's the thing. Taylor would have never even been in a position to make that play had he not been shifted to left midway through the third inning after second baseman Kike Hernandez came in to pinch hit for starting left fielder Jock Peterson against lefty Josh Hader. Now, as confusing as this series of events may be, to Taylor, it was pretty much routine. See, Chris Taylor is part of a baseball revolution. He came up through the Mariners system as a shortstop. Upon his trade to Los Angeles for top prospect Zach Lee, however, everything changed. Over 140 games played in 2017, his first full season with the club, the Dodgers used Taylor in center field, left field, second base, short, and third. But Chris Taylor isn't just any run-of-the-mill utility player. In fact, Taylor may be the best current example we have of what has come to be called, creatively, the super utility player. Now, he's certainly not the first of these, but he's leading a charge that has seen MLB undergo some major changes over the past decade. What makes a player a super utility player? Does your team have one? And just why are they so valuable? Don't worry, I'm going to cover all that and more. First though, let's talk about how we got here. Get ready, because this is the part of the video where I talk about advanced defensive metrics and Derek Jeter at the same time. I'm just putting that out there so y'all can get a head start on the angry comments, which you're totally free to do. Just know two things first. One, I'm a Yankees fan. You don't need to convince me Jeter was great. And two, I know these kind of fielding stats are far from perfect. Just watch my video on Andrew Jones if you want further proof. But now that that's out of the way, onto the Jeter hate. From his rookie season in 1996 through 2003, Derek Jeter collected six All-Star nods, four World Series rings, and his fair share of MVP votes. During that time, he had gone from top prospect to World Series hero to the captain. And if defensive metrics like ultimate zone rating are to be believed, he was a pretty lousy shortstop. Across his first eight full seasons in the league, which also happened to be most of his peak, Jeter had a UZR of negative 3.7, 143rd out of the 214 players with at least 1,000 innings in the field over that time. That's middle of the pack at best, and a far cry from the numbers being put up by the likes of, oh, I don't know, let's say Alex Rodriguez. From 96 to 03, A-Rod had an ultimate zone rating of 23.7, that was 10th in the league in that time, and by far the highest among shortstops. He was also worth 9.4 D-War to Jeter's negative 1.6, and for those of you who are into fielding percentage, why? To add to this, Rodriguez was also recognized by people within the game as the superior fielder, having won the gold glove in both 2002 and 2003. So when A-Rod was traded to New York prior to the 2004 season, the Yankees recognized him as the obviously better shortstop and moved Jeter, right? No, that would have been stupid. Instead, A-Rod voluntarily moved away from the position he had excelled at his entire career, all out of deference to the captain. Now, had he transitioned to eating a well-balanced breakfast and taking his vitamins every day by this point? Almost certainly, but that doesn't change the fact that the Yankees probably would have been better had A-Rod taken the shortstop role. So say what you will about the man, and believe me, there's a lot to say. But A-Rod recognized that to New Yorkers, the name Derek Jeter was synonymous with shortstop and no amount of advanced metrics would ever change that. See, Rodriguez and Jeter were playing at the tail end of the pre-Moneyball era, a time before front office's prime directive was wringing every ounce of quote-unquote value they could out of every last roster spot. What this meant was that you would often see players occupying highly demanding positions in the field long after they had any right to do so. That's how you end up with Mickey Mantle playing center field with the knees of an 80-year-old, or Mike Piazza pretty much anywhere. By the end of the decade, however, things were beginning to change. In 2008, a young upstart out of Illinois with a more experienced, white-haired partner named Joe at his side worked together to achieve victory for the blue team in unprecedented fashion. 
I'm talking, of course, about Ben Zobrist, Joe Madden, and the underdog story that was the 08 Tampa Bay Rays. Ben Zobrist started as a shortstop. He had man short from his days at Dallas Baptist University to his time in the minors for both Houston and Tampa, and had played every one of his 665 innings between the 06 and 07 seasons at the position. He was also pretty awful at the plate during these years, hitting exactly 200 in his first 300 career plate appearances. His on-base and slugging were both dismal as well, contributing to a league-worst OPS Plus of 33 over that span. Entering the 2008 season, though, the Rays had a new look. They had dropped the devil from their name, and with it, whatever evil had been keeping them pinned to the floor at the AL East for the previous decade. They revamped their logo and their roster, bringing in starter Matt Garza, calling up soon-to-be Rookie of the Year Evan Longoria, and trading for shortstop Jason Bartlett. This last addition also spelled the end of Ben Zobrist's tenure as the Rays' semi-regular shortstop. Luckily for Ben, Joe Madden, now in his third year as manager after taking over for the much-beleaguered Lou Pinella, had another spot for him. Well, actually, he had a couple. See, Madden, while not the first person to embrace Moneyball, certainly put his own twist on the concept. In addition to being the first manager to systematically deploy defensive shifts, Madden, as far as I can tell, was also the first to have a slumber party themed road trip. Or grunge themed. Or hockey themed. Or you get it. When his team struggled, he told them to stop coming to the ballpark so early. When his hitters slumped, he had them stop taking extra batting practice. When some of the Rays began sporting mohawks for good luck, Joe joined in. This was all part of an effort by Joe to make the game as comfortable as possible for his players, fostering what Madden referred to as unconscious competence. Now, was Madden Ball, as it would eventually come to be known, the secret to the Rays' success? I mean, it didn't seem to hurt, at the very least. He had catcher John Jaso take over the leadoff spot for much of the 2010 season. Same with slugger Carlos Pena in 2012. During an interleague game, Madden had outfielder Sam Fold, who had just pinch hit for the pitcher, take some warm-up throws on the mound in order to give the actual reliever time to get ready. MLB patched that loophole pretty quickly. Madden's unpredictability got to the point where onlookers couldn't tell the difference between deliberate strategy and genuine mistakes. During one game in 2009, he was forced to bat pitcher Andy Sonnenstein third after incorrectly filling out the lineup card. Many watching assumed it was just another one of his schemes. Aside from that instance, though, there was usually a method to Madden's madness, and his prized pupil was none other than Ben Zobrist. It was in 2008 that Madden began moving Zobrist away from his previous role at short, and started playing him, well, pretty much everywhere. Across 62 games played in 08, Zobrist put up 293 innings at shortstop, 79 in left field, 41 at second, 27 in center, with a few more scattered between right field and third. The Rays made it to the World Series, and Madden won Manager of the Year, turning his success into a contract extension that would keep him in Tampa through 2012. I would be remiss, however, if I didn't also extend credit to Rays GM Andrew Friedman, who constructed a pennant-winning roster on the lowest payroll in the American League. Remember that name. Friedman, for his part, fully endorsed Maddenball, and the Rays were all in entering the 2009 season. Zobrist, meanwhile, kept roaming the field, taking up Lodge in whatever spot would have him for the day. He excelled, too, breaking out with a 297 average, 27 home runs, 91 runs batted in, and an OPS plus of 149 over 152 games. He mostly split time between second base and right field, but would end up starting at least one game at every single position, excluding pitcher and catcher. He made his first of three career All-Star teams, and finished eighth in the AL MVP vote. He also hit anywhere in the lineup, providing valuable consistency at nearly every spot. 2009 put Zobrist on the radar for most casual fans, but for sabermetricians, the emergence of Ben Zobrist was a revelation. He posted 8.6 B-War in 2009, first in the AL among position players, and second in all of MLB behind Albert Pujols. According to Baseball Reference, Ben Zobrist was a more valuable player in 2009 than American League MVP Joe Maurer. From 2009 to 2014, he put up a 270 batting average and hit a hair under 100 home runs. He wasn't as flashy in the field as, say, Andrelton Simmons, but he was a strong defender, putting up 74 defensive runs saved over that span. He started 481 games at second, 249 in right, 87 at shortstop, 21 in both center and left, and 11 at first. Now, he wasn't the first player to do this. Utility players have been a thing throughout most of baseball history. 
The role has, traditionally, been given to players who, for some reason or another, can't quite cut it as an everyday starter, but make themselves just valuable enough in the field to stay on an MLB roster. The difference with Ben Zobris, though, was that he wasn't just good enough to be a regular starter, he was a major league level starter at multiple positions. Ben Zobrist was worth 36.1 B-War during the five years spanning 09 to 14. This was the third highest among all players during this period, trailing only Robinson Cano and Miguel Cabrera, and ahead of Adrian Beltre and Evan Longoria. He ranks third all time in B-War among all Rays. And let me tell you, people's reaction to this information was pretty mixed, to put it lightly. Rather than accept the idea that Ben Zobrist, of all people, was just as good as a Triple Crown winner, critics took these numbers as proof that war simply didn't work. Now, maybe this was just a mental block on their part, the product of an outdated baseball culture struggling to come to grips with the new reality of the game. On the other hand, it kind of makes sense. Just think about it. If a player is most productive in the field at a certain position, then they should start every game at that spot in order to, theoretically, maximize their value. The problem with this is that there are nine positions in the field, making it much less likely that any one team will be able to fit their nine best hitters into the role they're best suited for. This was the case with A-Rod and Jeter. If you've got two players who, in theory, play their best at the same position, then one is going to have to move to a spot where their value can't be fully appreciated. With Ben Zobris, though, the Rays had a wild card, a switch hitter who could be penciled in at virtually any spot and not lose value, allowing Tampa to put their best nine hitters up on any given day against any given matchup. He was a utility player because he was special, not because he was forced into it. Joe Madden knew this, and constructed his lineups around the star. Zobrist wasn't the tenth man, he was the first. A player like Zobrist also helps relieve the damage done to a club by injuries, as they can shift positions to accommodate gaps in the field. As writer Neil Weinberg put it, he's the best insurance policy money can buy. Ben Zobrist was the prototype for a new kind of player, one which would earn its own name beyond the ill-fitting description of utility guy. He was the first in a wave of quote-unquote super utility players. Now, Zobrist will tell you that he became this type of player by chance. If he was a better hitter in the minors, he probably never would have been moved from shortstop in the first place. These days, though, it would seem that everyone wants a Zobrist of their own, to the point where teams are even beginning to develop their top prospects to play multiple positions. The Mariners are one such example. When they acquired 23-year-old Shed Long from the Reds in early 2019, general manager Jerry Depoto announced the club's intention to play Long, a second baseman since 2016, at third, left, and center as well. The Los Angeles Dodgers have also excelled in this regard. The Dodgers are a scorekeeper's nightmare, not only changing up the lineup between games, but moving players around in-game like they were a Little League team trying to spread around time in the field. Unlike a Little League team, however, LA has ridden this strategy to the winningest record in baseball since 2015. This was the year that Andrew Friedman took over as the team's president of baseball operations. Remember him? I hope you do. I specifically requested it. It was Friedman who brought in Max Muncy and Kike Hernandez, both of whom played multiple positions before joining the club. Cody Bellinger, meanwhile, was groomed for versatility from the start, manning first base in all three outfield spots over his time in the minors. And it's no coincidence that upon trading for Trey Turner from the Nationals in 2021, the Dodgers started playing him at second base for the first time since his rookie season in 2016. Of course, the Dodgers aren't the only team doing this, even if they may be the most successful. In 2021, 27 MLB teams sported at least one player who appeared in 10 or more games at two or more positions. Taking an even closer look shows that 58 out of the 132 qualified batters from last year fit this description. That's 43.9%. Turn the clock back to 1990, and that number drops to 30 out of 128 batters, or 23.4%. Over the past 30 years, Major League Baseball has seen the proportion of utility players nearly double. One reason for this is the expansion of bullpens league-wide. When planning out which 26 players will occupy their roster at any given time, most teams have chosen to go with eight, and sometimes even nine, man bullpens. With the dearth of spots left afterward, the utility player becomes a manager's best friend. This also ties into the previously mentioned aspect of these guys that stats like war don't really account for, the value of the extra roster spot. You can see the platonic ideal of this concept in Shohei Otani, who plays the role of MVP caliber hitter and Cy Young level pitcher, all while taking up only one spot on the roster. Now, was this just a thinly veiled excuse for me to show you this picture of Otani? Maybe. Do I regret it? Absolutely not. 
beyond roster construction, the way the game is played has changed to suit super utility players better than ever. Defensive shifting, a major aspect of Joe Madden's game, has helped to dampen the harm done by otherwise average to below average fielders. And when your second baseman is positioned in right field half the time already, making him an outfielder almost becomes a formality. And as strikeout rates climb ever higher, balls in play continue to drop. So while defense is still important, every year it becomes slightly less so. Now, whatever combination of factors is behind the rise of super utility players, it would seem that at least some of them are finally being recognized for their value. After all, if you're going to be doing two jobs, you should be compensated as such. Taylor was selected to his first All-Star team in 2021, a season in which he put up at least 60 innings at six different positions. Over the five full seasons Taylor's played for the Dodgers, he's averaged four wins per 650 plate appearances. And he got paid for it too, signing a four-year deal worth $60 million that December. It would seem that super utility players aren't just on my mind either. Buck Showalter, for one, is on the record as being in favor of adding a utility slot to the All-Star Game rosters. Now with these comments, Buck was mostly referring to the Mets resident super utility guy in Luis Guillorme. But I'm curious, if you had to add one utility player to the All-Star Game, who would you go with? Is there a player like this who you think is currently being overlooked? Give him some love in the comments. Now I want to take a second to thank Element for sponsoring this video. If you're like me, you've probably heard a lot about how important electrolytes are, but you're still not really sure why. As it turns out, electrolytes facilitate hundreds of functions in the body, including the conduction of nerve impulses, nutrient absorption, and fluid balance. When you sweat, though, you can lose up to several grams of electrolytes per day in the form of sodium. When this sodium isn't replaced, it's common to experience muscle cramps, fatigue, and sleeplessness. That sucks. That's also where Element comes in. With Element, you get a tasty electrolyte drink mix, packed with everything you need, and nothing you don't. Other mixes you might find are usually stuffed with sugar, coloring, artificial ingredients, and other fillers. But not Element, which is used by everyone from Olympic athletes to everyday exercise enthusiasts. And right now, Element is offering you, my viewers, a free sample pack with any purchase. That's eight single serving packets free with any Element order. This is a great way to try all eight flavors or share Element with a salty friend. Get yours at drinkelement.com slash baseballh. This exclusive deal is only available through my link at drinklmnt.com slash baseballh. Try it totally risk-free too. If you don't like it, you can share it with a salty friend and Element will give your money back, no questions asked. You really do have nothing to lose. Stay salty.